Documents now reveal that an Obama State Department official, Jonathan Weiner, was in contact with the Russian embassy political chief one month before Donald Trump's inauguration as president. The material obtained by Judicial Watch also shows that State Department officials continued to use unsecure blackberries for the transmission of classified material a year after Hillary Clinton's use of her unsecure server had been discovered. Joining us tonight is Christian White. He's a senior fellow at the Center for the National Interest, former State Department senior advisor in both the Trump and George W. Bush administrations. Chris, it's good to have you with us. Let, let's, let's start with the Judicial Watch documents. This is stunning stuff. Uh, and that document is how important uh, do you believe? You know, I think it was. It pertained to points that were being generated for the foreign minister, Lavrov, Russia's foreign minister. So the implication being John Kerry may have been preparing to speak with Lavrov in the waning days of his tenure at the State Department. Uh, and this was very classified and it was forwarded on unclassified systems. This is sort of left over where I guess if you're a Democrat or one of these deep state critters, you're, it's OK to break the law and do that. Not if you're a Republican, they'll throw the book at you, but also raises serious questions. Again, uh, it, it frankly raises more questions than it answers because we still don't know sort of the true nexus of Christopher Steele and the fake dossier on Donald Trump that was totally phony and how that came to be. But it looks like State Department officials may have played a role in that. And Jonathan Weiner appears to have played a key role as Steele's conduit to U.S. diplomats. Uh, and, and that seems important here uh, as we are now starting to look at where the real collusion was taking place and with whom. Right. Why, why was he? Why were they connecting with senior officials at the Russian embassy? I mean, Weiner's job was supposed to be about Libya. Right. So what was the role here? And frankly, it raises questions about Russia's role. I mean, the left has sort of assumed that Russia has tried to help Donald Trump win, even though it was feckless and played no real role in doing it, even though it tried. But who knows? Maybe there are elements in Russia who really were in on this conspiracy to stage a coup against the elected uh, president of the United States. Wouldn't that be something? Uh, because the collusion now it seems to be decidedly uh, tilting toward uh, the other party, if you will. Uh, it's unclear whom, uh, if there is indeed collusion of any kind. Uh, it, it's deeply troubling uh, to watch this, this, this process of the Dems, which they formalized today, but they can't legitimize. So I'm not sure exactly what they, have, they think they're doing. Uh, but don't they don't the Dems have a bit of a problem? They bring in Tim Morrison. We're hearing very clearly that Tim Morrison, who resigned his post at the, at the White House, uh, was absolutely supportive of the president uh, and very candid about uh, his judgment of that phone call. Right. And Tim has a lot of credibility. Tim's a friend of mine. He served with former Senator John Kyle uh, in the Senate mm -hmm. as his aide and then on the House uh, Armed Services Committee before going to the NSC. I don't know why Tim resigned, but it may have just been because of conflicting advice, other whether he should or should not testify. And he spent a lot of time on Capitol Hill. But anyway, the result was not what the Democrats hoped for. He is one, unlike a lot of these deep state crybabies who are out there saying, oh, Donald Trump cut us out of the process on Ukraine, or he didn't take my brilliant advice on Russia. Tim was actually on the phone call, one of the very few people in this mix who were, and he said there was nothing illegal on that call. Of course, we already know that from the transcript, but yeah. it's you know nice to have a, a first-hand witness reaffirm that. It, it, it is, and like you said, we do have a transcript, and we've just learned that uh, 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 Tim Morrison's uh, last day on the job will be tomorrow, Chris. The, uh, then let's turn to this Colonel Venman. He is an interesting fellow in large measure because of his opening statement in which he talked about the interagency. He talked about the consensus of the interagency and he actually was informing people what uh, the, uh, the National Security Council would abide and what it would not. Uh, this is a man who has a very high opinion of this, uh, this monolith that's rising out of the swamp called the interagency. <laughs> Uh, and a very low opinion of the Constitution, which does give foreign policy to the president to uh, carry out. 
Yeah, what we have here is a collection of the palace eunuchs have who have decided they know better than the emperor and would prefer to rule in his place. The interagency process is just a collection of bureaucrats from across the agent from across various national security agencies. And so you just have to ask yourself, uh, who sets foreign policy? The Constitution says the president does, and I think most Americans think the person they elect to be president does. But you have these critters like, and what is it with these lieutenant colonels who come out of nowhere who want to have World War III with Russia? It reminds me of lieutenant. Lieutenant Colonel Ralph Peters, who, of course, you know, thinks Putin is worse than Hitler and wants to start World War III. But, you know, what this is, is really rank insubordination. This isn't whistleblowing. This is, yeah. he just said, what? I have feelings. I feel that Donald Trump is doing something unethical. Donald Trump had no idea who this guy was before five days ago. Christian White, we know who you are and we appreciate you uh, <laughs> being with us. Thanks so much. Christian Thanks, White.